Hey guys, welcome or welcome back. Tisha here for another chapter read of 50 Years in Polygamy. As I said before in the previous review, if there is something triggering in this chapter, you will see on the thumbnail something along the lines of trigger warning. And that's my heads up that we're going to be talking about something serious. Please do me a favor and like the video. It does help the channel. We are in Chapter 6, My Salvation, 1960. About 35 miles from Murray, near Tuella, a cavern of seven or eight cars pulled off Highway 80, traveled a half a mile or so down a dirt road, and parked near a water hole approximately six feet in circumference and about four feet deep. On a bitter cold Saturday in the spring, I stepped out of dad's car wearing only a pair of white socks and my long white cotton slip with a large blue towel wrapped around me. I wonder if she's getting baptized. There was a brother 11 months older than me, a brother six months younger than me, several of our cousins and a few more kids who were just over the age of eight who were going to be baptized. For those who would become members of the LDS church, baptisms were then and are still customarily done in a baptismal font in an LDS temple, chapel. <laughs> How did I get temple from chapel? I don't know. Would it be me if I didn't butcher something? <laughs> For fundamentalist Mormons, this ordinance is performed wherever possible, usually in a swimming pool, a pond, or a mud hole. This ritual served to wash away our sins, grant us membership into God's church, and prepare us to be confirmed with the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Sunday school, we learned having the gift of the Holy Ghost would let us know right from wrong if we listened. So in their belief system, you could only get the Holy Ghost if you were baptized? Or am I reading that wrong? In the middle of the pond, clothed in white, John Thomas held both of his arms above his head with both of his hands facing forward away from him and began to pray. Our Father in heaven, by the power of the holy priesthood, I dedicate this pool of water for the purpose of baptism. I ask thee at this time to cleanse these waters from earthly elements that might be harmful to the human body. I ask thy spirit to be with us at this time. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We watched John baptize two of his children. He called my name and reached in my direction as if to take hold of my shivering hand. Mom directed me toward him, but his haunting eyes forced me backward away from him. Wow. Her body knew because this is like the third chapter that we've heard this man's name mentioned and she's had a visceral response. Her body knew something was not right about this man. I cannot wait to hear what he did. I won't go into the water with him, I told my mom. I don't like John. I want Uncle, Uncle Marvin to baptize me. This time, mom didn't try to persuade me into compliance. She respected my childhood intuitions. Holding my little hand, she smiled. While John Thomas performed baptisms for several more children, I wondered if something was terribly wrong with me. Why do other children and adults seem to trust and like a man my little soul is so repulsed by? Uncle Marvin's white shirt and white slacks clung to his long, old-fashioned undergarments as he baptized his son and daughter. Um, you ready now, Sophia? He asked. He stretched out his large, comforting hand and helped me slide into the muddy pond. He grasped my hand snugly and showed me how to hold my nose closed while he ducked me under. Are you ready now, honey? He asked. I nodded. He said, Sophia Allred, having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Then Uncle Marvin pushed me backwards under the water and a signed witness made sure every single part of my body had been immersed. I got dressed in the car, my privacy protected only by the towel mom held in front of the window nearest the crowd. I've been taught that ba the baptismal lesson several times. Still, there were things I didn't understand. Dad said God is perfect and he's also created nothing but perfection. His babies and our souls all come to this earth 
perfect and innocent without a sin or blemish. Yet by the time we are eight years old, we must have committed so many sins they have to be washed away. I was still uncertain about the sins I'd apparently committed. I also wanted to know what bad things all the other kids have done. If I only knew, I could determine if they measured up to the bad things I supposedly done. No one was quite sure how to satisfy all of my never-ending questions. It's okay, they tell me. Sometimes we don't understand all there is to know. But now you have the gift of the Holy Ghost to discern right from wrong. It's all in God's plan of salvation. Surely you want to be a part of his kingdom, don't you? With all my heart, I wanted to be a part of salvation. Whatever it was, I certainly didn't want God to take all of my family to heaven except me. Yet I was quite sure he would do exactly that. After all, I got the impression everyone in our neighborhood knew me as the naughty, abandoned kid with a dirty face and unkempt clothing, the matted hair orphan for whom God and most of the adults had no special regard. Interesting that she called herself an orphan, maybe because her mom worked so much um, working on her nursing. Our huge upstairs front room served a dual purpose. In my heart, I knew there had to be another reason why dad built such a massive room and kept it so empty. My brother Daryl would set up a row of folding chairs so Uncle Rulon and his priesthood council, my father, Uncle Marmon, uh, is it Elsie Jensen, E-S-L-I-E, father of the current prophet of the Alred group of group or apostolic united brethren, and John Thomas, could face their small but rapidly growing congregation. Here, each of the men would take turns conducting Sunday school, Sunday sacrament meetings, and Wednesday night priesthood meetings. I still felt sick to my stomach around John, so I always tried to sit as far away from him as possible, which was never far enough. My cousins, siblings, and the few non-relatives in the Allred group looked proud when they were asked to stand and bear their testimonies. It really shouldn't be hard, I often thought to myself, especially since I'd heard the same exact words repeated over and over again since I was an infant. Still, I just about slid off my chair when Daddy asked me to come up and bear my testimony. I was sure my heart was going to pound right out of my chest and bounce across the floor. I let go of Mom's hand and sauntered to the front where everyone in the room stared at me in contemplation. Of course, all my know-it-all thoughts escaped me in holy terror and got stuck somewhere between my brains and my mouth. I couldn't get one word out. After what seemed like forever, Daddy, who was directly behind me, gently held onto my arm. It's okay, little Sophia. You can say a few words, can't you? You don't have to be so scared. Just tell us what you're thankful for. I shook in fear with what seemed like 500 people gawking at me, expecting me to come through. At last, I attempted a few familiar words I heard from older kids so many times before. Um... Uh, I'm thankful for, um, um, my mom and, um, um, and my dad and, uh, uh, I'm thankful for God and for Jesus. With those few words finally out, I was able to pick us up speed and start feeling pretty good about myself. And I'm grateful he died on the cross for me and you to pay for our sins. What sins? I still wondered. Sidetrack. I stopped cold. What sins did all of us commit? For a minute or so, I panicked. Would everyone know what I was thinking? They must not have because their kind eyes and gentle smiles urged me on. Okay, I can do this, I told myself. And uh, I'm thankful for my brothers and my sisters and for my cousins and for all of my relatives. Then I blurted out the most important part. And I know the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. My eight-year-old convictions had just gone on a replication rampage, but inside my heart, it didn't feel real. Did I just lie again? I questioned myself. I'm not sure if I know the gospel is true or what the gospel really is. All the other kids say they know, why don't I? I shouldn't have said I did when I don't. Flustered again and scared, I may have been caught in a lie. I felt my face turn red and my eyes start to wander. Water. I had to finish and get back to my chair as fast as I could. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen, I said really quickly. Dad squeezed my arm. 
Good, honey, he whispered. A few of the adults giggled appreciatively as I made my way to the far end of the front row. Once I was in my seat, a few more smiling relatives gazed in my direction. Mom put her arm around my back and kissed my forehead. Very good, my darling. I passed my performance with fine colors. Notice that she said performance. It wasn't something that she felt in her heart. It was something that was rehearsed and she knew that she needed to say. And as we know, they've been taught certain things and repetition is key for them. One day, dad asked me if I wanted to walk up to Aunt Marianne's house with him. Of course I did. He held my hand and we walked so slowly it was driving me nuts. Dad, can't you walk any faster, I asked. Sure, he picked up his pace. Come on, Daddy, can't we run? Guess so, if you're sure you want to be left behind, he looked at me questioningly. Of course I'm sure. Let's race to Aunt Marianne's front door. I'll be leaving you in the dust. Dad smiled. I smiled back and said, one, two, three, go. I waited on the front porch for Dad. What took you so long, I teased. It felt so good to shout those familiar words my brothers used to say whenever they want to race. I had no idea you could run so fast, Sophia, he said, as he picked me up and gave me a huge bear hug. I kissed his neck, and so he wouldn't feel bad. I told my 46-year-old father, it's not because you're slow, daddy. It's because you're getting so old. <laughs> dad laughed. You know what's funny? My dad is older i'm not gonna say his age because my dad he's funny about stuff like that not telling his age but it, having all the business out there on social media but we'll say my dad is in his upper 60s right we'll say that much and my father can outrun all of us i don't know if it was where he grew up if it was the military or whatever, but my father has always been fast. And to this day, he does not play about his cardio. No, for your young age, you are quite speedy. For weeks after our daddy-daughter competition, I overheard him brag about my incredible speed. Running was exhilarating and it was as close as I could come to flying. I stretched every leap and stride to the maximum. I dreamed the wind would swoop me up and carry me high above the trees where I'd be in control of my, my speed. Once I was completely exhausted and couldn't sprint a minute longer, I would drift down to the earth and catch my breath again. Now I had a reason to run even faster. I wanted my dad to be more proud of me than he already was. I ran faster and longer every day. I begged everyone to race with me. Dad's praise of my speed gave me a short-lived sense of purpose, and for the first time, I felt I had an individual identity among his huge family. Ooh, that's a big deal. Something that you don't think about when you have that many siblings, because I'm sure she had a bunch of them with, at that time, three moms. In our Sunday school class, the seven and eight-year-olds would sit on the edge of the two beds in my brother's room while one of our older cousins gave the lesson. One conflicting subject was faith. Our teacher told us in Matthew 17, 20, Jesus says, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And in Luke 17, 6, he says, and the Lord said, if ye have faith, as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamore tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But even more, my cousin told us, if we had no doubt or fear and faith as strong as Jesus' faith, we too could walk on water, even as he did. After he, her profound lesson, I knew I had strong enough faith to walk on water as well. Goodness gracious. I didn't know one iota about swimming. Oh, no. And was terrified of water, even up to my chin. But at Uncle Rulon's pool, I boldly stepped toward the deep end to prove myself and to Jesus. I, too, had far from I, too, had far more faith than just a grain of a mustard seed. I waited for a good clearing between the guys who were diving off the board and coming up in the shallow end. I am not afraid. I have faith, I told myself again. And without a shadow of a doubt, I knew I could walk on top of the water clear to the other side. 
My faith was strong. I could hear my teacher's reassuring voice. If ye have faith, even as a grain of a mustard seed, it seemed like I'd taken two or three steps before my terrifying descent to the bottom of the pool. Panicked and devastated, I thought I was going to die. Later, mom heard me tell God I didn't like or trust him anymore, especially this time because he always made promises he didn't keep. He did respond, mom explained. He didn't let you drown. He made sure Shane would jump in for you and pull you to safety, didn't he? But what about the faith I had? What about those promises from God, you, daddy, my Sunday school teachers, and the scriptures? All of you keep promising me protection, and again, it didn't happen. I cried. No matter how hard mom tried to explain God's reasons for letting me drown letting me down another time i was heartbroken and in turmoil either god hated me and thought i had to be punished or he didn't care about me enough to protect me there had already been way too many unkept agreements i'm best three youngest daughters were all close to my age i loved to hang out with them but they were girls girls who wanted to play house or dolls most of the time i always preferred playing tough boy games like pligville to me bore the signs of entitled male egos and chauvinistic patriarchal mentality because I was a girl. I was banned from basketball, football, and soccer games with the guys no matter how many times I begged. I had to pacify myself by playing house with my female cousins. My role, I always insisted, was of the storekeeper, the nurse, and the mailman, anything but one of the mom, kids, or wives. Aunt Beth's girls portrayed their female roles to perfection. Just like their mother, they were humorous, exuberant, and full of pizzazz. Because of the stroke Uncle Link Layman had when I was two years old, I never could understand what he said. His half-leaning shuffle, saggy bloodshot eye, and drooping mouth always scared me, but I felt sorry for him. One afternoon, while playing house in the barn, Deeply immersed in our laughter and child's play, we heard his loud voice coming from an open door. He sounded irritated and angry. Apparently, his daughters already knew how to evade his temper. Without a second hesitation, they quickly darted around him and disappeared, leaving me trapped and scared and senseless. Uncle Lehman shook his head, shook his double doubled up fist near my face while he ranted on and on. Not one of his angry words made a bit of sense to me why are are you mad <laughs> it says i tried to ask <laughs> i thought he was the one saying it but it was her i squeezed past him aiming for the narrow doorway but not swiftly enough to escape his fury powered by his pent-up frustration uncle lehman's functioning arm swept my way back before he landed his doubled up fist in the middle of my back. Goodness gracious, this girl just getting it on all ends. In the bathroom, I often stared at the baseball size, hideously colorful bruise between my shoulder blades to remind me why my back hurt so much. From then on, I avoided him. He always scared me. And after that unwarranted incident, I didn't like him either. I don't blame you. One beautiful summer day, a cousin who was close to my age asked, why did you pick all of the tulips and dad and dandy foal uh, and daffodils from my mother's flower garden? I told her I didn't, but she insisted I did. Trying to convince her or anyone else of my innocence was totally futile. She said someone saw me do it. So it was a fact, she said. Everyone knows you did it, Sophia. So you're a big fat liar. Tormented by her accusations, I felt the whole Pligville nation had thrashed me with a belt and condemned me to hell. It was cock full of sadness and injustice, feeling insignificant in our community, in heaven, and at home, school, or anywhere else, I would wander. She really spent a lot of time feeling lonely and feeling like she wasn't enough, and it's sad. At home, deep under the covers of mom's bed, I cry myself to sleep and wonder why I was on this earth in the first place. Why did I exist? A few weeks after the flowers were stolen, another cousin told me they'd been discovered in a large paper bag in the backyard where my accuser had tried to hide them. Remnants of leaves and petals were left in a tin can. 
I wonder who did it. Still, in my opinion, neither God nor Santa came through for my mother. Either she was gone, crying, angry, sleeping, working, or reading. Because remember, in the last chapter, her only wish was for her mother to be happy again. And here she's saying, Santa didn't even answer that. She could have asked to stop being abused. She could have asked to stop having uh, the, the assault happen to her. She didn't ask for any of those things. She just wanted her mother to be happy. And here Santa didn't grant that, nor did God. She, I believed, had become proficient at escaping unpleasant life situations. Whenever she was through with her work, she'd read. She'd read at home, on the bus, in the car, in the bathroom, and in the bed. When we talked to her, she'd answer, uh-huh, uh-huh, as if she was listening. Our method paid off when we wanted to go somewhere or do something. She would otherwise have answered no. In the realms of her religious books, mother could avoid her conflicting feelings and emotions. She would stay in her soothing, peaceful solitude and gather a million more righteous reasons to sojourn there even longer. Even so, mom tried with all her might to keep her promise to be a better, happier parent. In order to spend more time with James and me, she took us one at a time with her to Lytton's rest home where she worked graveyard shifts. My paper sack held a coloring book, some crayons, a, ja a jack set, and a book. Things for me to do between the times I watched or helped with her, her geriatric patients. Occasionally, mom had something significant to talk about besides the gospel of Jesus Christ and how I should always be a good girl. Otherwise, more of often than not, I felt ignored. No matter what did or didn't happen, I was sure she loved me. Late at night, when most of her patients were asleep and I was dozing off next to her, she would cuddle close to me, kiss my forehead and cheeks, and tuck the loose strands of hair behind my ears and over and over again. Um, I'm surprised her mother got away with bringing her to the job. Hmm. Lincoln was 27-year-old amputee from whom, whom mom had been caring at the caring for at the rest home she felt so sorry for him and she invited him to come live with us since marlene was married as a second wife and gone besides helping lincoln meant mom could earn a little extra money i was fascinated by the way he could maneuver his whole body through the house without his wheelchair he moved swiftly by swinging his torso and the five inch stumps of his legs back and forth using his large muscular arms and hands as as legs and feet. Lincoln was really kind and always wanted me to hang around to visit or play games so he wouldn't be so bored and lonely. Yet right from the start, something about him gave me the creeps. To sit with him very long made me feel crazy and I felt so sorry for him. And every now and then mom reminded me to be nice to him. So I'd make myself sit long enough to listen to another one of his gruesome war stories. On one of those annoying occasions, Link said I should check out how terrible his scars look. Oh, goodness. Please tell me that this baby is not about to be assaulted again. <sighs> he took my hand and put it on his thick, grotesque scars where his legs had been cut off. I cringed. Now feel this, he said, and he moved my hand onto his swelling penis. I gasped pulled away, and ran for the door. Stop, Sophia, please stop, he yelled. Because of my stupid childish worry for him, I froze. I was surely tempted by his bribe of $5 if I promised not to tell anyone. That wouldn't be 25 bucks nowadays, but for me, back then, it was like having 100 I walked out of the room without saying a word to him. All I could think about for the next little while was what I could have bought with five whole dollars. In spite of everything, a tiny part of my heart felt bad for ratting on him until Lincoln had another place to go. Mom forbade me to go near him ever again. 
Stay clear away from that evil man, she said. I was stupid to let him stay here in the first place. Maybe I shouldn't have told mom what happened and just stayed away from him, but Lincoln was not my brother, family, or anyone I was afraid of or believed I had to protect. Hmm. Most of the time, I had no idea to whom I was accountable or who was responsible for my well-being while mom was gone. After school, I played outside until it got dark and cold. Sometimes I'd hang out at Aunt Beth's house until she sent me home. I'd wander down our long driveway towards home to nothing, to no one. I'd dangle my legs over the side of the bridge and stare at torrents of white water bouncing across the boulders, dancing in my direction. They'd smash against the concrete portals on either side of the conduit and then in one deep surge disappear under our bridge. Why does not Beth know how lonely I feel, I asked myself. Feel, I asked myself. If she really loved me and cared, she let me live with her and treat me like one of her own children. Maybe she'd adopt me, but she doesn't want to hurt mom's feelings. This girl lived a lonely life. To be surrounded by so many, but feel so alone. Whenever I'm at Uncle Marvin's home, he always had a hug and a smile for me, but I never feel welcomed by any of his wives. Mom's words popped into my head. Be grateful for your blessings when you feel sad. Don't ever feel sorry for yourself. I'm okay, I heard my voice say out loud. The words startled me back to the reality of the entrancing ditch water. Chills ran across my arms. I'm glad Aunt Beth lets me stay as long as she does. I said repeatedly, I smiled the rest of the way down our long driveway. Every night in my dreams, I walked to the top end of the south field near our home. Though the ditch was wide and swift at the high point, I tromp into the middle of it, lie down on my back, and float peacefully all the way down and under our bridge. As I float under it, I see splotches of black and green moss along with innumerable cobwebs and spiders covering the rock and concrete walls. I glide on the water as its way between our yard and Uncle Marvin's, as it wound its way between our yard and Uncle Marvin's. As I approach his bridge, I would sweat with anxiety. There was no stopping. And I knew once I floated under his bridge, I get stuck and drown until I could wake myself up. It felt like I was really dying. Over and over again, night after night, I woke up crying from those dreams. I didn't dare play in the ditch during the day, nor did I want to fall asleep at night. One night when I could no longer resist sleep, I decided to let myself drown under the bridge. No one would miss me anyway. Oh my goodness. My lungs hurt like there'd been no tomorrow, but the nightmares never returned again. Near the end of that long, hot summer, I stood in our enormous yard full of dirt and rocks, spun around three times and wished summer would hurry and end. I wanted to be in third grade. That's the end of the chapter. Oh, that was weird. Okay, it was just a reoccurring dream. She decided to let herself drown under the bridge, but she didn't do it. After she, okay, so after I had to reread it, y'all, because it was sounding funky to me. So after she decided to just go ahead and do it because of the anticipation and how scary that dream was, then she never had those dreams again. I was about to say, what kind of way is that? <laughs> So at this point, all of these things have happened to her and she has not made it to third grade. This is just the summertime. So she's probably going to start third grade in the next chapter. So here we are, uh, six chapters in, and she has been assaulted by three different men. Put that into perspective. Third grade is what? Oh, eight, eight or nine. Because she was eight when she got baptized. So eight between eight and nine years old, this child has been assaulted by three different people on multiple occasions. Just goes to show you how much she's been through. And it kind of frustrates me 
knowing this little bit that we've already read. And then I think back to the episode with the Browns, if you watch Sister Wives, when she came on and Christine was really nasty to her and told her that um, her husband was a really, really evil man. And she felt sorry for her, but you didn't think about all these other things that your aunt probably had been through because you were so afraid that she was going to take the cloak off of your situation and polygamy. <laughs> Excuse me. Just, just goes to show you, you never know what someone is going through. And seeing that woman on the television screen, I halfway want to go back and rewatch the episode. Maybe I'll listen to myself talk about it. But knowing that this woman has been through so much and eventually changed her name makes me interested in knowing the rest of her story. That is it for chapter six. And I'll see you next time.